Um, so I'll go ahead and just a little bit about myself real quickly. Um, in addition to being an anesthesiologist, I'm also an, um, uh, an intensivist. I staff the surgical ICU at our hospital eight to 10 weeks a year, and I'm also the clerkship director at our school for the anesthesia rotation. Um, but that's enough about me. Tonight, we want to take the opportunity to do this virtual boot camp to start uh, giving you kind of a nice basis of uh, of anesthesia understanding for the for the next seven weeks or so, so that you can enter your your fourth year rotations really ready to kind of impress and look like a rock star. Um, I'll let me see here. Oops, here we go. Um, I do not have any disclosures, and before I go any further, I just want to say um, I wanted to thank Dr. Uh, Dr. Hofkamp, who's actually on this call very much for coming up with this great idea for an anesthesia boot camp. I wish something like this was available for when I was a when I was a student uh, trying to impress uh, go or uh, in trying to decide if I wanted to do anesthesia. So thank you for including me, Dr. Hofkamp, and I'm really excited to uh, to teach. Uh, to teach these young minds. Um, Thank you very much, Tim, for your uh, for your uh, hard work on this. Look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, so first of all, just so everyone's, uh, uh, if you're watching this recorded uh, and you haven't reviewed this, the materials that we're gonna be talking about tonight is from Miller's Basics of Anesthesia, that's the eighth edition. We're gonna be talking about chapters five, six, and 26. And what I've tried to kind of focus on is more of the, what the clinical points that will that you can apply when you are um, when you are actually on your rotations. Um, so that's kind of going to be the focus tonight when we go through the materials. Oops. Um, so kind of the overview this evening. So first, uh, since I have the microphone, I get to choose like every lecture. I get a couple of minutes for my soapbox and my advice on kind of how to use this, uh, what you're going to learn this evening and throughout the boot camp. But then we'll go ahead and review the content that's discussed in Miller's Basics. Uh, again, I'm going to try to focus on more of that clinical information that you can use while you're on your rotations. And then finally, probably the most important part is I'd like to illustrate some of that clinical information with some cases, kind of discussing how the best way to present an anesthetic plan is at the same time kind of learning these topics. And then I, that's a lot of tr kind of trying to all squeeze in at once, but hopefully at the end, we'll try to have a time for a little bit of questions as well. Um, so to start off with my soapbox, um, the while this is a great opportunity to get some great clinical knowledge and some great basic knowledge to kind of wow your residents and your um, and your faculty when you're on these rotations, I want to say though maybe one another very important point, maybe even more important on some of these rotations, is also to show your interest and your willingness to do hard work during your anesthesia rotation. Um, you want to be able to really express how excited you are about the rotation um, and kind of be yourself, in other words. I, I tell students who I'm working with as fourth year students, um, I honestly, this is, this is me personally, I can't speak for everybody. I don't care if you have a mind blowing board score or that you got honors in physiology and pathology during your first and second year. Truthfully, when I'm working with somebody, I like to see somebody who's, who's eager to learn, who's teachable, and probably most importantly, somebody who I could see myself with and would like to, uh, could see myself with working, would like to work with. Um, so remember, while definitely dazzling people with your background knowledge is important, make sure that you're yourself. And remember, it's kind of like an interview too. So um, just remember that part. But with all that said, let's build that content up for you. But so first, we're already done with the soapbox. So no more soapboxing. We'll go ahead and move on to review of content for this evening. So chapter five is the clinical cardiovascular and pulmonary physiology review. Um, let me first say this chapter, really reading this again, really does a fantastic review of basic uh, cardiovascular and pulmonary physiology. With that said, with our compressed time frame and the fact that you guys, I, I hope, all the medical schools you guys have gone to, the, the different medical schools you guys have gone to, I'm sure that you took physiology at some point. This is a great time to review that, but I don't think is a good spot here because what we really want to do is review the kind of the clinical information that you can use on your rotations. Next, I'll also say there's an excellent review on basically why we give patients fluid. They do a really nice discussion of cardiac output as well as a review of the Frank Starling curve. I'll encourage you guys to review that as well. However, I don't think it's the time and place right now to get into the nitty gritty of the physiology. Rather, I picked a couple of topics that 
kind of indirectly apply here that I think that you can be that you can probably use uh, more is more applicable during your fourth year rotation. And that's basics of mechanical ventilation and evaluation of hypoxia. So for basics of mechanical ventilation, people make this way, way too hard. So there is every acronym that you can think of. There are multiple different types of ventilators, depending on what manufacturer makes which ventilator, they call the settings different. Just forget all that. Pretty much everybody in the anesthesia world who's paralyzed on a ventilator getting surgery, almost everybody is on some form of volume control. Yes, it might be traditional volume control or PRVC or pressure regulated volume guaranteed. It really doesn't matter. In the end, you are picking a volume control and try, you're picking a, vol, a tidal volume that you are aiming for and the ventilator is trying to reach that tidal volume. That's it, right? So um, there's basically only four things that you can control on the ventilator when it comes to volume control, at least things that you should focus on. There's tidal volume, respiratory rate, FiO2, and PEEP. Tidal volume and respiratory rate are adjusted to, uh, to clear CO2. So if CO2 clearance needs to be increased, you either increase your tidal volume, breathing deeper, or you increase your respiratory rate, breathing faster. That's it. FiO2 and PEEP are used to control oxygenation. If you need to improve oxygenation, the adjustments you can make on the ventilator are either increasing FiO2 or increasing your PEEP or both. Keep it simple, 95% of ventilation in the operating room truly is that. I would focus on just those points and then move on to another topic. The next topic I think would be worth to, to discuss is the evaluation of hypoxia. So as you can imagine in the anesthesia world, hypoxia, evaluation of it and recognition of it and how to treat it is pretty important and needs to be done quickly. Um, my advice to you is make sure you have a system and use clues for differential uh, use clues for a differential diagnosis. If somebody comes in and you already know that they have severe asthma, if they start having if they start desaturating, having hypoxia, you know one of the high things on your differential should be a bronchospasm, right? Many of my colleagues and myself included uh, have a system where we either start at the patient and work our way back to the machine or vice versa when we're evaluating a patient for hypoxia. So me, I'll go ahead and give you an example on how I would do this. Let's say if I have a patient who's desaturating in the operating room, the first thing I do is turn the FiO2 up so that I have a little extra time to evaluate why is this patient starting to drift down from a, from a SAT standpoint. Then I listen and evaluate the lungs and consider the lungs and what might be going on at that level. Is there pulmonary embolism, pulmonary, pulmonary edema, atelectasis, bronchospasm, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Next, I consider the bronchial tree. Did the patient aspirate on induction? Did they aspirate after induction? Maybe there's a mucus plug. What about moving next to the endotracheal tube, plugs, kinks, maybe dislodgement? Then talking about the circuit, is there maybe a kink? Is there a disconnect, which is, a, which is something that can certainly happen? And then finally, I move, my, uh, move all the way back to the machine. It seems unlikely, but there could be a hypoxic mixture. Is there an inadequate amount of PEEP or O2 for the patient's condition? Maybe there's a machine failure. And usually the last thing I try to, I always try to do is not, is not consider that the monitor is not working until I make sure that there aren't other issues going on. So the question ultimately at the end is, is it the SAP probe? 